Good morning, brothers and sisters. In the Lord, thank you, Pastor Vladimir, for serving, Pastor Corey for serving. Doesn't that sound good? Amen. Sounds good. You know, it's not easy for those who English is their second language to stand before a group of English speakers and to read the Word of God. So pray for them. Pray for us. And I'm grateful to the Lord for these dear brothers, and that includes Pastor Ed, and I'm grateful to God for all of you. In the fourth century, there was a theologian and a priest by the name of Gregory Nazianzus. Gregory Nazianzus. And he was the Archbishop of Constantinople. In AD 381, Gregory believed that Jesus began his ministry by being hungry, yet Jesus is the bread of life. He believed that Jesus ended his earthly ministry by being thirsty, yet Jesus is the living water. He believed that Jesus was weary, yet he is our rest. And Jesus paid tribute, yet he is the king. Gregory of Nazianzus correctly identified Jesus as the Christ, Jesus as the king. By God's grace, he saw Jesus for who he truly is. And so we're in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, which we just read. The sermon is entitled, The Christ, or Christ Identified. Christ identified, and the main point is Jesus is the only Son of God and the Christ of God's people. I'm using very specific language today because our sermon is very important. If we don't understand what's happening in these two verses, you're going to lose the gospel. And so I want to take time in point two and point three to explain what's going on, but the main point is this, Jesus is the only Son of God. And the Christ of God's people. If you remember in Luke chapter 3, John challenged the crowds. He called them, you brood of vipers. That is not a good way to make friends. But he wasn't trying to make friends. He was trying to challenge them for their sins. And so the people were internally wrestling with the question, this John the Baptist, this crazy man out in the wilderness, is he the promised Messiah? Is he the Christ? that we are waiting for and we've been waiting for. And so John the Baptist understands what they're saying internally within their own hearts, and John makes it very clear. I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. I am not the promised one. But there is one that's coming. God made a promise, and God will fulfill that promise. That promised one is coming. The anointed one is coming. The Redeemer is coming. The Deliverer is coming. And this person is so great that I'm unworthy, I'm unqualified to unstrap his sandals. And so John says in verse 16, this is a key verse, by the way, to understand what we're trying to accomplish today. In verse 16, John says, I baptize you with water. He's saying, what I did for you is merely external, merely physical. Baptism, by the way, is a picture of spiritual cleansing, religious cleansing. He says, what I did for you is extremely physical and only external. He said, but the Christ, the greater one, he's coming and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The Holy Spirit, meaning salvation. And with fire, meaning judgment. I talked about that last week. And so judgment is real. Judgment is on the way. Judgment is for certain. And so John uses this illustration or this picture of wheat and grain, that the wheat has an external thing around it called chaff. And it, all it takes is a little bit, of, little bit of wind. And the chaff, the light chaff, removes or separates from the real wheat or grain. And so he's making this illustration that the chaff is going to be collected at one point in the future and be burned up. But the grain will be safely taken into the barn. And so John continues on in his ministry, and John preaches the good news of sin. I know that sounds weird, but that's the language of Luke chapter 3, that in order to get to the good news, you've got to get to the bad news. And the bad news is, Herod, you're in sin. 
you got this weird looking man, John the prophet, a prophetic minister of the word of God, and he's challenging the higher ups. He is challenging those in authority. He's challenging Herod the Tetrarch. He's not a king, but he's a ruler of the region. You got this poor, measly prophet cha challenging basically the king of that area, the ruler of that area. And so because John is challenging the ruler of his sin, what is his sin? That Herod the Tetrarch had a sister-in-law, Herodias. Well, he ended up marrying his sister-in-law, and she became his wife. And so John the Baptist challenges him that what you just did, this ungodly union, this unbiblical union, is sin against God. And he makes it very clear that he is sinning against God. That's what ministers of the word do. They don't shy away from the truth. They call sin, sin. They don't call sin mistakes and faux pas. They call sin, sin. That's what faithful ministers do. And then because of that, John the Baptist is now locked up in prison. So that's the background. Now we're in verse 21, at the beginning of verse 21, and it says that all the people were baptized. It doesn't say who the people were. It doesn't say how many people were baptized. It doesn't even give you the exact location of where these people are baptized. But Luke is not, per se, interested in providing that information. He's trying to get to the main points. He's trying to get to the facts. But we need to make a distinction at this point that there is a massive difference between baptism of sinners, that's you and I, you and I us, and baptism of Jesus Christ. There's a massive difference. Don't make the mistake of thinking that these two are the same. Because the baptism of sinners, if we were to take ourselves and have Pastor Ed dunk us in all of that water right there, that would never change your heart. That's just external. It's just external. It's just physical. Baptism of sinners or baptismal regeneration, just because your body touches water, doesn't change the heart that's inside of your body. Your sinful, wicked heart. It doesn't change any of that. So baptism in and of itself doesn't make you right with God. Doesn't cause God to love you. Doesn't cause God to forgive you. Doesn't cause God to welcome you into heaven. No. No. Not at all. But we need to understand that the baptism of Jesus is much different than the baptism of sinners. And so when we look at the parallel account of Matthew, Matthew chapter 3, by the way, of Jesus being baptized, it says that Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. So in the parallel account, we understand that Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. There was much water in the Jordan, and he was baptized by John the Baptist. And so why does Jesus need to be baptized? That sounds weird. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Redeemer. So why does Jesus need to be baptized? Well, if we remember that in John's ministry, John is simply a forerunner. He's preparing the people for someone greater. He's telling the people, you're in sin, repent, because the one who is greater than I, the one who bestows salvation by the work of the Holy Spirit, the one who will judge you for your sins is on the way. As a matter of fact, he's here. He's here. He's the promised Messiah. We've been waiting for him for thousands of years, and he's here. So when we look at John's ministry, he's simply preparing for a greater ministry. And in Luke chapter 3, verse 3, John proclaimed what? A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. But Jesus doesn't need to be forgiven. Jesus has not committed one sin at all. Jesus has not violated the law of God at all. He doesn't need to be forgiven. He has no sins. Hebrews 4.15 is clear about this. That he was tempted in every way like us yet without sin. Three of the greatest words in all of the Bible. He is without sin. You can't say that, and I can't say that. What we can offer to the table of God is sin and much of it. But Jesus is completely opposite of us. 
He is the one with no sin. So why does Jesus need to be baptized? Well, this is where we put the Old Testament and the New Testament together. In Isaiah 53, verse 11, Isaiah 53, verse 11, it says this, Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So in Isaiah 53, the prophet is talking about that there is a great one coming, this Redeemer that's been promised, the Old Testament Messiah. And this promised one is going to make many righteous, this servant, this servant of the Lord. He's going to make many righteous, and he's going to do something very special. He's going to bear their iniquities. So he's not going to simply be their righteousness and make them righteous through this promised Messiah, but he's actually going to stand in their place and take on their punishment that they deserve, and yet he is without sin. That's what Isaiah 53 is talking about. It's talking about this suffering servant. But when we connect Isaiah 53 to Matthew 3, it says this, John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? What this is talking about, John the Baptist sees Jesus, the Christ, coming to him. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus says, you need to baptize me. And John the Baptist says, no, 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 no. You need to baptize me. And Jesus says to John, let it be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. He says, when you baptize me, we are fulfilling all righteousness. And then John the Baptist said, okay, let's do this. What does it mean to be righteous in the Bible? To be righteous in the Bible means you're without sin. To be without sin means what God requires of you, what God requires of his people. The righteous demands of God's law must be not violated, but must be satisfied and obeyed. To satisfy and obey God's law perfectly in all places everywhere means that you're the perfect one. And if you're the perfect one, then you have the righteousness that God requires. And through Jesus is how us, God's people, are righteous and God accepts us for being righteous. We don't have a righteousness of our own. That's why the great reformers and scholars of the past would say, the righteousness that we have is a foreign righteousness. It's an alien righteousness. Why? Because it doesn't come from within us. It comes from outside of us. It comes from above us, comes down to us, and is given to us, or if you want to be technical, imputed to us by faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus says we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And so when we connect Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, with Matthew 3, fulfilling all righteousness, we end up with this. We end up with a suffering servant, the promised Old Testament Messiah who fulfills all righteousness because for you and I to be forgiven, we have to be righteous. And the only righteousness that God will ever accept is the righteousness of His Son. Not your righteousness. Don't think for one whole minute or one whole second, that you have righteousness that God will accept. You have enough righteousness for God to send you to hell. Because why? You have knowledge of the Holy One, and yet in your sin, if you're not a Christian, you've rejected the Holy One that God has provided for you. So, when we think about this, Isaiah 53 and Matthew 3 put together, we have the righteousness of God in Christ because Christ has satisfied and obeyed every jot and tittle of the law of God perfectly. And not only that, he dies on your behalf. He dies on my behalf. It would only make sense in our finite minds that we die for our sins. Why? Because we committed real sins 
against God. We didn't commit fictional sins or theoretical sins. We committed real, heinous sin against the living, holy God. And yet this perfect one that we've been singing about all morning stands in your place. You deserve judgment. I hope you understand that. Because unless you get to the point of saying, I deserve the judgment of God, you will never appreciate the good news of Jesus Christ. You will never. So what has Jesus done? In his perfect life, we have righteousness imputed by faith. We receive it by faith. Faith in what? Not faith in faith or hope in hope, or trust in trust, or belief in belief. That's what all non-Christian religions do. But it is a hope and faith in the object of our faith, and the object of our faith is Jesus Christ. So if you say, well, I got faith, well, then you're no different than XYZ Church down the street. But if you say, I got faith in Jesus Christ, then you have completely separated yourself from dead religion. And so, what do we have? In the life of Christ, we have the righteousness that God has accepted. But you still need to be forgiven. And the way that you're forgiven is your sin has to be paid for. And Jesus has taken our sins upon himself on a tree, on a cross. And he dies the most horrible, brutal death in human history. No person should die that way. We should die that way. But Jesus shouldn't die that way. And yet he takes our sin upon himself and he dies the most horrible, brutal way in human history. So through the life of Christ, the perfect life of Christ, we have righteousness that God accepts by faith in the Savior. But through the death of Christ, we are forgiven. You need righteousness and you need forgiven, forgiveness and that only happens through Jesus Christ. I hope we understand that. Jesus is the only one who merited our salvation. And so what does the baptism do? The baptism of Jesus identifies as Jesus with his people. Jesus identifies with his people through his baptism. For those who repent and trust in him. He has come to fulfill the righteousness you need and I need but only can be fulfilled in Christ. And he died in our place. So the people were amazed. The people were baptized. Jesus was baptized. And now we see Jesus praying in public. He's praying in public. If you understand the context correctly, we've got a group of people. This is not a private affair. This is a public affair. And Jesus is praying in public. This shouldn't surprise us, right? If you've read through the Bible faithfully, you'll know, especially in the Gospels, that Jesus not only prayed privately, but he prayed publicly. Our Christ, our Savior, our Messiah prays privately and publicly. Should that not encourage us and motivate us to pray? It should. Why do you think we promote the 130 prayer service all the time? Because apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. That's why. If Jesus prays, we should pray. And I hope we see our daily need of him. You need him daily. We sing that song, do we not? Just about every month. I need thee every hour. But if we were to be honest, functionally speaking, we sing the song in a different way in our hearts. I need thee every two years when I have a financial catastrophe or when my children or grandchildren die or when my marriage falls apart. No, we need to be honest when we sing that song, I need thee every hour. We need Jesus daily. And after Jesus was baptized and after he prayed, there are three amazing, glorious things that happen in our text today. And you'll see that in your bulletin. Number one, the heavens were opened. Number two, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus. And number three, the heavenly voice. So number one, the heavens were opened. We see that at the beginning or the second half of verse 21. The heavens were 
open. There are several verses throughout the scriptures that talk about heaven being open. That language that heaven literally opens. And then when heaven opens, something special, something miraculous, something glorious happens when the heavens open. And I want to provide an example here. Genesis 28. Genesis 28, verse 11. If you remember the story, Jacob has been traveling. He's tired. He stops in one place. That place is Bethel, by the way. And he's tired, and he goes to sleep, and he takes this rock as his pillow, and he lays his head on the pillow. And he dreams, and he has this interesting dream that the heavens were open. Even though it doesn't use that language that of heaven open, that's exactly what happens. Heavens opens, and this ladder or this stairway starts from earth and goes up to heaven, and he sees angels going up and down this ladder, ladder or stairway, up and down, up and down. And so the Lord stands above this ladder or this stairway, and he declares a promise to Jacob. This is a land promise, that your descendants will inherit all of this land. And so the key part of this verse is the ladder. What's the purpose of the ladder? Have you ever thought about that? What is the ladder? What is the purpose of the ladder? Why is this beautiful staircase from heaven to earth and earth to heaven? Well, in John chapter 1, Jesus says, sees Nathanael. Jesus sees Nathanael. And Jesus describes Nathanael as Nathanael's coming to Jesus. He says, an Israelite indeed, where there is no deceit. And Nathanael says to Jesus, how do you know me? He said, before the brother called you, I saw you under the fig tree. And Nathanael says, you are the son of God. You, Jesus, are the son of God, the king of Israel. That's what he's saying. And then when we get to verse 51 of John chapter 1, it says this, and he referred to Jesus. Jesus said to Nathanael, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending. Okay, so he's quoting Genesis 28. But here's the difference. He doesn't say the angels are ascending and descending on a ladder or a staircase. He says the angels of God are ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Son of Man. What is Jesus doing? In Je- Jesus is quoting Genesis 28, but he says now that ladder or is that, that staircase in the dream of Jacob is me. Jesus defines who the ladder is. It's himself. And so what's the idea here? The idea is, is that this staircase that goes from earth to heaven or this ladder is the idea of angels going up to heaven to worship the true God, the living God, the creator, and angels going down to earth to do the bidding of God. What God has commissioned them to do, they will do. But ultimately, this ladder or staircase points to Jesus Christ. See, God is with his people, not ultimately through a temple. And God is not with his people through physical land. God is with his people through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. I don't have time to address every single occurrence in the scriptures about the heavens opening. But the idea that I want to get across is that when the heavens open, be prepared. Something special is about to happen. Which leads to point number two. The Holy Spirit descended on Jesus. We see that in verse 22. The Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus. And the Holy Spirit descended on him, referring to Jesus, in bodily form like a dove. The text does not say that the Holy Spirit is the dove. No, it says the Holy Spirit came down, descended upon Jesus like a dove. Like a dove. We need to make a distinction here that the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus in some sort of bodily form or physical appearance like a dove, and this dove-like appearance came upon Jesus and remained upon him. 
Why a dove? Well, if you understand the Old Testament sacrificial system, that a dove was used in many sacrifices. If they couldn't offer a higher value animal, a perfect animal, then you could offer a dove. Now, when you think of dove, do you think of lions? Do you think a dove acts like a lion or a lion acts like a dove? No, we don't think like that. If you think like that, you need help. But that, the reality is a dove acts like a dove and a lion acts like a lion. But a dove in Old Testament sacrificial system is an animal that represents gentleness, meekness, quietness, as this animal is about to be sacrificed. And so when we connect the idea of the dove to the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus is a ministry of reconciliation, is it not? That mankind sinned against God, and now there's this massive gulf, this massive separation between the holy God and sinful humanity. And the only way to bridge this gap is through a staircase or a ladder that comes in the form of Jesus Christ. It's a ministry of reconciliation. The English Puritan Thomas Goodwin says this about this verse regarding the dove. Quote, For a dove, you know, is the most meek and the most innocent of all birds, without gall or talons, having no fierceness in it, expressing nothing but love to its mate. A dove was a most fit emblem of the Spirit that was poured out upon our Savior when He was just about to enter on the work of our salvation. So before Jesus started his earthly ministry of reconciliation, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, like a dove, descended upon Jesus and remained upon him. I'm assuming, it doesn't say exactly, but it's implied that all the people at that time who were there saw the Holy Spirit come upon Jesus. And the reason I say that is because John the Baptist sees the Holy Spirit come upon Jesus. Because in John chapter 1, verse 32, it says this, I, referring to John, he's giving witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. That's Luke chapter 3, verse 16. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. What is John the Baptist saying? John the Baptist says, I physically saw with my own two eyeballs the Holy Spirit, like a dove, come upon Jesus, descend and remain upon him. I witnessed it. I saw it. And not only that, I didn't know that Jesus was the Christ until that happened. He knew that the Christ was coming. He knew that the Messiah was coming. He just didn't know that the name of, the, name of Christ was Jesus. And he says, I saw the Spirit come upon Jesus, and it remained upon him. This is the Christ. By the way, this is a fulfillment of Isaiah 11 too, when the Spirit of God came upon the servant. Isaiah 11 too. So he says that this Jesus is the Christ. And this Christ is the one who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, which is salvation in Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit, which is regeneration or being born again or the new birth or the new life. And this Holy One is going to baptize with fire. He's going to judge all those who reject him. He's going to judge them. So John the Baptist is saying, this Jesus, he's the Christ. He's the Son of God. The Holy Spirit confirmed it. I saw it, and I'm a witness to it. Jesus is the long-awaited Savior. Now that Jesus is identified as the Christ, what is Jesus' role? Well, in Luke chapter 4, verse 17, we see this, Luke 4, 17. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. So Jesus is in the synagogue, and he asks for the Isaiah scroll. 
Jesus unrolls the Isaiah scroll and found the place where it was written. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus saying this. He's saying, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. He set at liberty those who are oppressed. So Jesus says, what you've been reading in the Old Testament, the Isaiah scroll, has happened and is happening. I am he. I'm standing in front of you. I'm in the temple. I am the son of God. I am the suffering servant. I am the Christ. I am the one that you've been waiting for. And he, get, he gives a very clear job description. I'm here to liberate those who are oppressed. Those who are enslaved to sin. Sounds like John chapter 8, right? The one who sins is a slave to what? Sin. The one who sins is a slave to sin. Is that you? The answer is yes. But praise God for salvation in Jesus Christ. Because if you keep reading John chapter 8, if the Son has set you free, you are free what? Indeed. Praise God for salvation in Jesus Christ. But are you spiritually poor? Are you spiritually blind? You can't see Christ. You can't even see your own sin. Are you oppressed by your own sinful choices and lifestyle? My encouragement to you is turn to Christ. He's your only hope. He is your only hope. You could deny Christianity all you want. You could say Jesus is not the Christ. But the day you die is the day you're judged and you will bow the knee. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So you can stand in your own futile human strength and buck up against God, but the day you die is the day you bow the knee and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And that will be a horrible day for you. You say, Brother Rollo, you're scaring me. I might just believe you. Don't believe me. Believe Christ. I can't help you. But Jesus can. So turn to Christ. He's your only hope. He will save you. Which leads now to point number three. The heavenly voice at the end of verse 22. The heavenly voice. And a voice came from heaven. You, referring to Jesus, are my beloved son. With you, I, referring to God, am well pleased. In Jesus' earthly ministry as the Messiah, as the Christ, his role is to proclaim good news to those who are poor, to those who are oppressed, those who are enslaved to sin, those who are captive to sin and blind to sin. And if that is not enough to see the Holy Spirit come down upon Jesus and remain upon him, and that tells us and tells John the Baptist that this is the Christ, if that's not enough, then hear the voice of God. Then God the Father speaks. He identifies his own son. And not only does he identify his own son, he doesn't do it privately, but he does it publicly. God the Father identifies Jesus as his son, and he's well pleased in his son. He takes delight in his son. Now, if you think about that language, you are my son, and in you I am well pleased. When you think of that verse, this is really echoes of two other verses, and I hope you write this down. This is echoes of Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, and Isaiah 42, 1. Psalm 2, 7, and Isaiah 42, 1. In Psalm 2, it says this, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. If you remember Psalm chapter 2, the context is the nation's rage. And the nation's rage against the Lord's anointed. All the earthly kings, all those who are in power, who think they're in power, they hate God's anointed. And the Lord presents the true king. The true king in Psalms chapter 2 is the son. 
The son is the king. And so the Lord identifies his own son ultimately as the true king. So hold your place there. Isaiah 42.1. Isaiah 42.1. This is talking about the servant. Not just any servant. This is the chosen servant. This is not just any chosen servant. This is the Lord's chosen servant. In verse 42, it says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. So Psalms 2 talks about, you are my son, and now in 42, chapter 42, we see that God's chosen one, he delights in him. He delights in him. In chapter 42, explains that the Lord is, a, is, he has a chosen servant that he's pleased in. But there's two reasons for this in chapter 42. Number one, justice. And number two, salvation. Justice and salvation. Justice is mentioned in chapter 42 three times, and that's the emphasis of the author. That God is going to bring judgment. God is going to bring perfect justice. Justice will be served. That's his point. But also, in the same chapter, chapter 42 of Isaiah, God is bringing salvation. How do we know that? It says it in verse 6. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind. Who does that sound like? To bring out the prisoners from the dungeon. dungeon. Who does that sound like? From the prison who sit in darkness. Who does that sound like? That sounds like Jesus. This is a language of salvation. God will save his people. God made a promise to save his people. God sends the Redeemer and the Redeemer is here. It's ultimately fulfilled through Jesus Christ, God's Son. So when we think of Psalm chapter 2 and, and Isaiah 42 and put those two together, we get this, that the Lord, God the Lord identifies His Son. And His Son is the true King. And it's ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. And God the Lord is pleased with Jesus. Why? Jesus is the one who will not only judge, but Jesus is the one who will save. He will, say, he will save his people. He's going to save those who repent and trust in him. And he will judge those who reject him. It's very clear in the text. So, Christ is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's why the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 2, kiss the son. Kiss the son. Kiss the son is not about a literal kiss. Kiss the son means submit to the king. Submit your life and your will to the king. Because if you don't submit to the king, the king is going to take a rod of iron and he's going to crush you. He's going to judge you. He's going to dash you into pieces like a potter's vessel. So it would behoove you to trust in Christ. So in Luke chapter 3, in verses 21 and 22, this is what we get. This is what we receive. Brother, you mind giving this to Brother Pat Atherley? Brother Pat, yeah. please drink that water. In Luke chapter 3, in verse 21, this is what we get from the text. We get God the Father. This is the voice that comes from heaven. We get God the Son, Jesus the Christ, the one who was baptized by John the Baptist so that he would identify with his people. Jesus is the one who was praying as well. And thirdly, we get God the Holy Spirit who descended from heaven like a dove upon Jesus the Christ and remained upon him. So what are we getting? We're getting one God, three persons. 
You know, I always try to trip up my kids. I always try to put my kids in a corner and say, how many gods do we serve? Three gods or one god? I'm like, oh, daddy, you're trying to get us again. One god, daddy. Is there three persons or three gods? No, there's three persons, not three gods. And I know that the doctrine of the Trinity is a very difficult doctrine to understand, but this is what the Bible preaches. This is what the Bible teaches. This is something that is not some minor issue. No, this is a major doctrine. We've got to understand this to some level if you're going to honor Christ with your life, and especially as a church. So there is one God, three persons. One God, that's Deuteronomy 6, 4, right? There is one God, three persons, the Trinity. That's what the Bible's teaching. You'll never find the word Trinity in the Bible, by the way. It comes from the Latin Trinitas. But the Bible's very clear that there's three persons and one God. In the Jewish culture, they would never preach or teach polytheism. They always believed in one God. So we need to make sure we understand that there is one God and three persons, for this is what the Bible teaches. The Father is God. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. They're co-eternal. Not created. Co-eternal. But the Father is not the Son. And the Son is not the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father. Imagine if I walked up to you one day and I said, Dear brother, dear sister, hear the word of the Lord. Like, if you hear me say something like that, just turn around and run, right? <laughs> but if I were to walk up to you and say, You know what? Did you know that I am Pastor Ed? And Pastor Ed is Pastor Corey. And Pastor Corey is Pastor Rolo. How would you react to that statement? You would look at me like I have a third eye on my head and say something like, Brother Rolo, you've been on the state of Nevada approved drug, drug program from way too long. <laughs> way too long. You need to get off those drugs, Pastor Rolo. That, that doesn't make any sense if we, if we explain it that way. But there's one God, three persons. And why is this important? Please turn to Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to read with me. Ephesians chapter 1. This is why it's important. We're going to start in verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. If you're there, say amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and it says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved, Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he had lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him who were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. There is so much in those verses right there. 
I don't have time to go over every single item, but the thing that I want you to see is this, that there are three persons, and that these three persons, not three gods, not three its, not three impersonal forces, not three fictional characters, three real persons, three people who are working together to accomplish something great. And it's this. In verse 4 and 5, we see God the Father choosing His people unto salvation. He predestined His people unto salvation. That's Deuteronomy 7. That's Deuteronomy 9. That's all through the Bible. Those of you who don't like predestination and election, you don't have a problem with Pastor Ola. You have a problem with God's Word. I'm not here to try to convince you. You need to get into your prayer closet Take your flashlight from Boy, camp, Boy Scout camp and open up your Bible and read it and pray and say, God, help me understand this because I can't help you. So we got God the Father who chooses his people unto salvation. Then we have the second person, God the Son, Jesus the Christ, who dies in the place of God's people. That's verse 7, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. He's the one who lived the perfect life we could never live. He's the one who died a horrible, brutal death. He's the one who died in your place so that you would be right with God by faith in the Savior and forgiven by God through Christ. So we got God the Father who chooses. We've got God the Son who dies in our place. Then the third person, God the Holy Spirit, who's within every true believer. And in this Verse, at the end of that section, God the Holy Spirit is within every true believer. How do we know? Because they're sealed. They're sealed with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be sealed with the Holy Spirit? That means that they are owned by God. If you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, you are owned by God. You are property of God. You no longer live for yourself. You are ownership no, God owns you. You are property of God. You're not property of God because you're a good person. You're property of God because of faith in Jesus Christ. Let's never disconnect that. You are property of God based on faith in Jesus Christ. So what do we have here? We have God the Father who chooses. We have Jesus who dies for his people. We got the Holy Spirit who seals God's people. So why, Pastor Olo, are you so passionate about this? The reason I'm passionate about this, that if you lose any person of the Godhead, you lose your salvation. You lose the gospel of grace in Jesus Christ. You lose the reason, the very reason why you have hope in the Lord. If you lose any person of the Trinity, you lose it all. That's why it's important. This is not some minor thing on a major, minor scale. This is a major doctrine on the highest scale. To lose the doctrine of the Trinity is to lose the hope you have. And so the true gospel is based on God's word. In other words, the true gospel is a Trinitarian gospel. People outside of gospel-centered churches can say what they, whatever they want to say. They could say, well, we have the gospel. We have Jesus, we have this, we have that. But if they don't have the Trinity, please listen to me. If they don't have the Trinity, they do not have the biblical gospel. The Trinity is what makes Christianity distinctly Christian. In the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, it affirms the Trinity in chapter 2, paragraph 3, and it says this, quote, in this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistence, the Father, the Word, which is the Son, and the Holy Spirit, of one substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, yet the essence undivided. And then it goes on to say, the doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence upon Him. What, is, what does the 1689 say? If you're going to commune with God, you have to hold on to the doctrine of the Trinity. 
But there are those who do not believe in the Trinity. And this is not a private matter. They make public statements that they do not believe in the Trinity. And I want to say this very clearly. They're not Christians. I'm not trying to sugarcoat that. I want to be as direct and honest with you, my church family. Those, there, there's a major difference between those who say, Pastor Olo, I just don't understand the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, that's one camp. But then there's another camp. Pastor Olo, I reject wholeheartedly the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, that's the problem. That's the camp that we have an issue with. There's a major difference between those two camps. One who says, I don't understand, and one who says, I reject. One heretic in the third century, he was known as a theologian and priest. His name was Sibelius. Sibelius. I believe his original intentions were good because why? He wanted to defend the oneness of God. In other words, he wanted to defend that the Jewish God, that there is one God, monotheism, right? Monotheism. He wanted to take Christianity out of the hands of ivory tower academics and bring it down to the level of uneducated uh, average people, lay people. He wanted to make Christianity simple for the uneducated. However, in his simplicity, he went way too far. In his simplicity, he went way too far. He became a heretic and he was excommunicated from the church in A.D. 220. Why? Why was he excommunicated? It's because of this. His position on the Bible is this, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are just three different hats, three different masks that God wears as the situation demands. I hope, that, I hope you understand what, what he's saying. He's saying not three persons, real persons. He's saying three hats. So if you have situation A, you wear this hat. When you got situation B, you take off this hat and you put on this hat. Or if you prefer, you have one mask, and then when the situation changes, you take that mask off and you put on another mask. But it's the same person who wears a different hat or masks. So he does not teach that there's one God, three distinct persons. He says these hats or masks are modes of God, depending on the situation. He also believed in what's called patripassianism, patripassianism, which is the suffering of God. The problem with that, when we look at John chapter 4, is God spirit or not? God is spirit, right? Those who worship him with spirit and what? Spirit and truth. But to say that the Father suffered is to make what the Bible says very clearly that God is spirit. Now God the Father is now a human being just like you and I, but he's suffering. So now the theological question becomes, did God the Father suffer on your behalf or did God the Son suffer on your behalf? Is God really God of the Bible? Is Jesus really the Savior, fully God and fully man? Or did he just simply seem to be fully God and fully man? Now you're edging on what's called docetism, right? Docetism believes that Jesus seemed to be human, but not really human. See, we got problems here. Theological problems, we got biblical problems, we got linguistic problems. There's problems all, all over the place with modalism or Sabellian modalism. Because the problem is this, the reason, I don't use the word heretic or heresy lightly, but I'm using it in this case. Because what Sabellian modalism actually does, it undercuts the work of Christ's ministry. It undercuts Christ's atonement for us. That's what it does. It takes away the only hope that we have. So if Jesus only appears to be fully God, and fully man, then really we have no hope at all. Right. We have no salvation. Why is this important? Again, let me stress, to deny the Trinity is to deny the hope that we have in Christ, to deny our salvation. If you take any one of these persons out, the Bible's clear, one God, three persons. But today, now it's 2022, 
It's a long time distance from A.D. 220. But you know what? Modalism, Sabellian modalism is alive and well today. Not only in America, but around the world. This movement is called the Oneness Pentecostal Movement. Oneness Pentecostal Movement. What I just said is heresy, and church history proves that, and the Bible proves that. It's happening all over the world. And one of the biggest proponents, last time I checked, I could be wrong, that holds to oneness Pentecostalism is T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes. And anybody in that camp, to believe in what he believes in is to take away the hope, the only hope that you have, the only hope we have in Christ. Because they completely dismantle the Trinity. They don't believe in the Trinity at all. Exactly. So I'm glad you brought that up. There are other religions who do that. Mormons deny the Trinity. Jehovah's Witnesses deny the Trinity. There's many, many religions out there that deny the Trinity. What makes Christianity distinctly Christian is the Trinity. So one of the things we need to be careful about is when people say, you know, I'm a Christian, I belong to XYZ Church, ask them a very simple question. What do you think about the Trinity? Because how they answer that question will determine if they have a biblical gospel or not. There is one God, three persons. So Jesus is the only Son of God, and He's the Messiah of God's people. How do we know that? The heavens were open. How do we know that? The Holy Spirit descends like a dove upon Jesus and remains upon Him. How do we know? Because there was a voice that came from heaven, a heavenly voice. God the Father identifies Jesus as the Christ, His Son. And Jesus is coming back for His people. Jesus is coming back for His people. And His people are those who repent and trust in Him. Please don't think you're a Christian because you were born in church. Please don't think you're a Christian because you got baptized. Please don't think you're a Christian because you said a sinner's prayer. Please don't think you're a Christian because some sort of man-made tradition or ritual or religious activity. The only way that we are Christians is by God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ when we trusted in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's it. That's it. But also, Jesus has some unfinished business. Jesus is coming back for his people. But Jesus also has unfinished business. And I want to read Revelations 19.11. This is for all unbelievers and the enemies of God. 19.11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. Jesus started the mission, and he's going to finish the mission. He's going to save his people, and he will judge those who rejected him. He's going to make war against all his enemies. He will judge them. And so for those of us who are not going to be judged, because we have placed our hope and trust and confidence in Jesus, as our Lord and Savior, be mindful of this, is that all of our sins, all of your sins, all of our sins have been placed upon Christ. And Jesus was judged on your behalf. Jesus was judged on my behalf. So we don't stand in horror, but we should be humble and grateful for what God has done for us in Christ. Sermon in a sentence. The triune work of the Godhead Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has guaranteed our salvation, and we must pray for non-believers and share the good news with them. Will you do that this week and honor Christ with your life? I pray that we will. Let's pray.